uh, they're both the same title. Same, they look the same. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> here's where I get, guys. I go to churches like this one, and I cannot tell you how many times uh, a broken-hearted pastor or a broken-headed parent comes up uh, and says, we sent our son or our daughter to a King James Bible believe in Bible college, uh, and they came back. First thing they heard was King James homosexual, Easter's mistranslation, uh, the italics need to be taken out. And they go to a King James school and come back and they break fellowship with their pastor, break fellowship with their parents, call their pastor a heretic. That happens all the time. Uh, and so that's why, uh, look guys, um, <clears throat> it's, like, it's like you're going to build a new house, you've got to dig the basement, and every night when you dig it, somebody comes in and fills a hole. Why rebuild, why redig the basement? Why should we be trying to evangelize our own kids again? Uh, and so um, back there, <clears throat> there's, two, uh, there's two stacks of these. There's the blue border, that's, that's for grade 11. Red border's for grade 12. They're, they're very similar to ACE. There's 12 pages, paces or 12 lessons per year. Uh, and these cover the stuff. Um, I'll tell you what I had. I have a young man uh, that I've preached to him literally all of his life. I uh, preached in his church before he was born, when he was born, watched him grow up. Uh, and uh, now these are aimed at grades 11 and 12 because we've got to nail them bef- just three months before they go into Bible college. That's some doofus. Some doofus guy goes, would these be okay for my grandson? I said, how old is he? Nine. No. Okay. That's why we have the color. No, no. Uh, it says time when there was no Bible. It's about this size. Okay. Anyway, um, and, and uh, they're, they're basically college level, but I can't wait till they get to college. Uh, a lot of times we get an adult who's never been to college and they want some material. That really arms them. Uh, and this young man, he took, uh, he took these in the 11th and 12th grade uh, and he went to the Air Force Academy. Uh, and he said, <clears throat> he's there about two weeks, uh, and, he, and he, told, he called his mom and he said, um, he said, uh, I, got, uh, I, got in, I was in a tent with 14 guys and um, let me tell you what, are they guys talking about the Bible? Yeah, now is, there, is, the short, that's the, is there a short one about this big? Yeah. Same, okay, bring that one too if you would. Anyway, um, let, me, let, me tell you what, let me tell you what a lost man's logic is, all right? You know what lost man's logic is? Those guys said, if God really wrote the Bible, there would only be one of them and not so many. You see, you've got to be saved to be stupid. That's truth. That's it, Doc. And so, um, and he said, Mom, he said, for the next two hours and 45 minutes, I taught those guys what I learned from these lessons. So they will arm you, you thank you, they'll arm you, they'll arm your children. Uh, I had a, a pastor, uh, his 16-year-old daughter was home alone. Knock on the door, here's two Jehovah's Witnesses. They got talking, and she said something about the King James Bible. Uh, these are called Valiant for the Truth. Uh, she said something about the King James Bible, and they said, well, there's mistakes in your King James Bible. And she told her dad later, she said, Dad, right there my valiant kicked in (laughs) and drove them off the porch with facts. So this will arm you. It will arm your children. Uh, So those are back there. Uh, And and, uh, I tell people, I said, if you take them one day, uh, you'll say it's a piece of cake. The other day, you'll say, why did I take these? But um, if you wonder why we have them in the bag, something about these screams, please take me free. And um, if you take one, you've destroyed the entire year's lesson. And I've, I've had people, we caught six people all walking out with a different lesson when I asked, where'd you get these? Well, aren't those free? They've never found those people's bodies. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, <clears throat> so those are back there. Um, this, uh, I did not write that we published this. This is called a chartered history of the Bible because it's a chartered history of the Bible. Uh, this one is um, the Alexandrian text, shows the, uh, shows the line. The, the value of that book, and I say this because this is what they told me. Uh, I had a guy come up and he said, uh, I hear people talking about Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and Tyndale and Vulgate and, and Erasmus. And he said, I don't understand. He said, I read that in one night. There's only about 20-some pages, 40 pages, 39 pages, 35 pages. And he said, now I got it. He said, now understand, like the Alexandrian text, two paragraphs, three paragraphs on the Alexandrian text, obviously not an in-depth study, but a definitive work. Uh, here's uh, uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, uh, Jerome's Vulgate, uh, Wycliffe's uh, English Bible, uh, the first Bible in English, 
the, uh, some of the other bad Bibles that come from the Alexandrian manuscript, Westcott and Hort, uh, distant relatives of two other famous, uh, a famous duet, uh, Abbott and, um, never mind. Um, and then this is the, uh, this is, uh, the uh, Antiochian text, our text, uh, that, that came down through, and there's the, the Bibles that came from it. This is an autograph. Autograph is not something you get on a baseball. Uh, the traditional text, that's one of the many names for the um, Texas Receptus, the Byzantine text, the Antiochian text, uh, the universal text, the, the, text that the Greek text that your King James Bible is based on, Erasmus Greek New Testament, Tyndale's uh, English Bible, first Bible translated from that text, some of the pre-King James English Bibles and your King James Bible. There's a section, there's a section in here uh, on the Old Testament, the Hebrew um, one of those Bibles, I want to show you this, one of those Bibles that preceded the King James Bible <clears throat> is the Geneva Bible. Uh, and then last, uh, this hit about four years ago, five years ago, I'll tell you when, wrote this in 08. So this is about 07. Uh, about 07, uh, all of a sudden I'm coming to churches and I'm seeing people walking around with a 1599 Geneva Bible that are King James Bible believers. Uh, I have this guy who is a, a King James Bible believer, and he was the real thing. And he would never go into his office uh, and study out of an American Standard or an NIV. And he goes, well, I've been studying out of the Geneva. And guys, you better understand something. They want, they will do anything to get the King James out of your hands. And so here's, the, here's what, how this thing is promoted. Well, this is before the King James, so it's got to be better. No, no, it's not. Uh, and so I read it. First off, this says um, the 2006 Geneva. You say, why? I thought you said 1599. Well, that's because they lied. If you just read what you get, and in the introduction of 1599, go get one. In the introduction pages, it says, this is a, this is a publication of a six, uh, 2006 update of the 1599. So it was a lie on the cover. Uh, but here's some of the problems with it. Um, you guys have heard this in... Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21, 19, where the Bible says, Elhanan killed uh, the brother of Goliath and the brother of his in italics. And in the NIV, they take the brother of out of that verse, causing not one but two contradictions. It contradicts 1 Samuel 17, because now you've got in 1 Samuel 17, you've got David killing Goliath, and now you have Elhanan killing Goliath in 2 Samuel 21. But that also causes a contradiction with the parallel passage to, to uh, 2 Samuel 21, which is 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 5 and 4 and 5, <clears throat> where it says very plainly with no italics, Elhanan killed the brother of Goliath. And we rail on the NIV for doing that. They got it from the Geneva. The Geneva doesn't put those italics in. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, when you go to heaven, you go on to heaven for forever or for a long season? Yeah, yeah. I was just reading my Bible last night that said something about for a long season. Oh, the children of Israel uh, were, were, I think it was the, talking about the children of Israel being in, in the wilderness for a long season. That's a long season, 400 years. But here's what the last verse, the last verse and I, of uh, Psalm 23, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord, what? Nope. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for a long season. Brother, if I'm going in for a long season, you know what I do when I go to heaven? I'm going to go find a rock to hide under. So that when they come looking for me when my season's up, I get to stay. And then there's this one, and I think this is kind of a classic. Uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, where it says, God hateth putting away. In the uh, Geneva, it says, uh, if thou hatest her, put her away. <laughs> Geneva's a pretty, pretty good Bible, you know. But anyway, no, so, um, uh, so... So that is back there. And here's the thing. With that Geneva, which is, by the way, being promoted by the Calvinists because it was a Calvinistic Bible, here's a thought for you. Okay, I tell, them, I tell Americans all the time, Americans quit thinking the day after they got their TV sets. And they cannot, they cannot have a thought unless they're holding a remote in their hand. And so this is all being pushed, that Geneva Bible, it's all being pushed by the Calvinists. Uh, I like, um, uh, I like uh, the guy in uh, Alito, Texas, uh, David Barton with Wall Builders. But he's Calvinist, and he pushes uh, the Geneva. And they go, well, you know, this was before the King James Bible. Do you know who petitioned King James for a new Bible? The Calvinists, the Puritans. They didn't even want the 1599. So give that back to them. 
when they go, well, look, this was before the King James. Yeah, and your guys didn't want it. They wanted the new one. So, uh, so uh, that book is back there. This one <clears throat> is our English Bible inspired. Uh, short answer, yep. Uh, long answer, not a very long answer, about 75 pages. Um, uh, that, that tells you how it, what, uh, some things about uh, your King James Bible. This covers two things really thoroughly. Uh, it shows the importance of preservation as well as inspiration. I always equate inspiration to putting a highway through. Uh, if you ever watch them put a highway through, it may take five, six, seven years. They cut the trees down, set, you know, they grade the land, build the bridges, put in the roadbed, pour the concrete. And, and after four or five years, when they're done, you have a road where there was no road, correct? All right. Inspiration is a uh, very crude, very simple, simplistic explanation. You got God, a man, a blank piece of paper, and when he's done writing, you have, you have the word of God where there was no word of God. But the day they cut the ribbon on that, on that highway and open it up, you know what starts? Maintenance. You put a road through and you don't maintain it. You know what you got? Pennsylvania. And so, um, and, and if, it takes, if it takes five years to put the road through, you're maintaining it into infinity. Isn't that true? And so I, I say this, guys, if God inspired the Bible and did not, did not or could not preserve it, then inspiration was a divine waste of time. Can you imagine taking 1,500? I've been working on this one book on Bible manuscripts for 10 years. And um, can you imagine God worked on the Bible for 1,500 years with 40 different guys? And when the ink was done on the last word, he said, okay, I don't care about it anymore. I can't preserve it, or I don't want to preserve it. And so inspiration without preservation is a divine waste of time. This book covers the importance of inspiration. It also covers the, the difference between a King James Bible believer and a what we call a TR man, Texas Receptus. Uh, there are some of the brethren just don't quite have enough faith to believe that that book is perfect, and what they, but they don't want to say that. So they take a step back. They think, well, I will pull the shroud of Greek around me, the TR, and, and then I'll be safe. It is not safe. It is not safe. Real quick. First, uh, you have turned there, but First John chapter 2, verse 23. The whole last half of the verse is in italics. You know why? Because it's not in the Texas Receptus. But it was in the original. And so God got it into your Bible. So uh, this shows the difference uh, between a TR man and a King James man. In fact, let me just give you a couple of thoughts, all right? Uh, first off, have you ever heard this? Have you ever heard that there's a King James controversy? Have you? Okay. Here, I'm, I'm making an announcement for you. There is no King James controversy. I am telling you, this is not, no, I'm not going to twist it. I am telling you there is no King James controversy. Now, I cannot prove this, but here is how I would prove it. <clears throat> if all of us who believe the King James Bible is the absolute perfect word of God, that's what you believe, right? Okay, let's say today. Now, we say the King James Bible is the absolute word of God, and then there's a whole slew of people who say, you guys are all wrong. Right? And they go, can you imagine this? James White approaches his Bible the same way an atheist approaches the Bible. I'm going to find a mistake. Can you imagine going to this Bible that you claim to love with that spirit? He has the same spirit of a lost man. I didn't say he's lost. But when you hate the King James Bible, when you go to it to say, I'm going to find a mistake, is that not exactly what a lost man goes to the Bible for? He doesn't go for spiritual enlightenment. Right. But if we who believe the King James Bible, if today we go, you know what, those guys are right. The King James Bible is riddled with mistakes. It is not the perfect word of God. Well, of course, they would cheer, right? But then we finish the sentence and say, the King James Bible is not the perfect word of God. The new King James is the absolute perfect word of God. Everybody that is anti-King James today, guess what they'd be tomorrow? they'd be anti-New King James. You know why? There's, it's not an anti-King James faction. It is an anti-perfect Bible faction. They hate the thought that there's a perfect Bible on earth. If we didn't say it was the New King James, if we said it was the English Standard Version, you know what they'd say? Well, when I look, you know, we're glad we got rid of that. they got rid of that stupid King James Bible, but, but the English Standard's just a version too. I'm telling you, these guys, 
believe, don't believe there's a perfect Bible anywhere on this planet, and any Bible that you claim is the perfect Word of God, they will destroy. Because here's what it is. I'll give you, again, I'll give you a thought. There's two kinds of evolutionists. <clears throat> there is the 16 or 18, 18 year old kid that graduates from high school. Uh, well, now he can't read, he can't write, and he can't spell, and he can't add, but, but he's still well fit for Congress. Um, that's that 18 year old kid believes in evolution for one reason he was told that. You show that kid some things, and you can get him straightened out. Okay? But then there's the teachers, there's the movers and shakers of evolution who know. The fossil record doesn't prove it. Did you ever stop and think about this, guys? If evolution is so true, how come NASA is still spending billions of dollars to try to prove it? Every rocket NASA sends up, if it's not for cell phones and if it's not for defense, it is, it is to prove evolution. How many times, you, well, we're going to go to Mars. We may find out how the universe began. It is, if evolution is so evident, how come they're still trying to prove it? And so the movers and shakers know that the evidence does not prove evolution. And here's why they believe it. They go, well, if evolution isn't true, guys, then the Bible is. And if the Bible's true, then there's a God. And I'm a sinner, and I'm going to die. And go, I believe in evolution. <laughs> they believe in evolution because of the alternative. Okay? You've got two kinds of Bible correctors. You have guys who graduate from a King James school. Uh, and they don't believe it because their professor showed them mistakes in it. They didn't, there's no mistakes in it, but they showed them what they preferred or, or professed to be mistakes in it. Show them where they're wrong, and you get them straightened out. But the professor, he knows, he knows the manuscript history doesn't, uh, doesn't, prove, uh, doesn't stand behind the Alexandrian manuscripts. He knows that those other versions are no good. In fact, James White, you know what the bonehead says? Somebody asked him on national television, what Bible do you think people should use? He says, well, just get any four that you like. Hey, how do you get to heaven? We'll just pick any one of any four plans of salvation. Uh, trust Christ, get baptized, speak in tongues, and join a church. That should get you there. Okay? And um, uh, here's what those guys do. They know that the, that, that the manuscripts don't prove their point. Here's why they accept, why they reject the King James. Well, of course there's not a perfect Bible on the earth. If there was a perfect Bible, now think about this, guys. If there's a perfect Bible, don't you think we're bound to read it? I said we are bound to read it. We are obligated to read it. If we are obligated to read it, uh, don't you think we are obligated then to change our life to it and buy it? And so they go, huh, if there's a perfect Bible, then I should be reading it and I should be living by it. And I should, uh, there's no perfect Bible. So it's the alternative. All right. Um, so that's, uh, that's just a couple of things. Uh, uh, these are uh, two of the newest books that I have. This is called The Time When There Was No Bible. Uh, I told you I'm working on this manuscript book. You ever put books on a shelf with no, no bookends? They fall over, right? Okay, I'm working on the bookend books. Uh, you, you put every King James Bible written, every book written on the King James Bible on a shelf, from easy to difficult. Uh, this is the easiest. This is what I call baby's first King James book. It is for color. Uh, it's called The Time When There Was No Bible. And it really is informative. Uh, I guarantee you this, the, the adult that reads this to their kid or their grandkid, uh, they will learn something about the Bible. They really will. I, um, uh, I, again, here's what I find. Uh, I find uh, kids who were brought up, some of them in this church, <clears throat> and they're brought up, uh, believe in the King James Bible, and then I get these parents, they come up to me and they go, we brought up our son and our daughter on the King James Bible. Now they go to a modern church <clears throat> and they're, they're using the NIV. And our grandkids are not hearing the truth. And here's what I tell the grandkids uh, or the grandparents. Buy the book, invite the grandkids over, and corrupt them. All right? And let me tell you where the safest place used to be. It is the lap of a mother. Right? How many children have learned life's lessons on the lap of their mother? Hey, Mom, you know, uh, the one the, of our youngest sons, when we, took, when we went on the road, our oldest son was 10. Uh, our second son was six, uh, and the youngest was one. So, so the first two had had some training in, in, in schooling in, uh, in um, Christian school. But Luke, the youngest, my wife taught him to read. And I watched him read the Bible the first time, and I thought, every time that boy reads the Bible, he's going to credit his mother. She's the one that taught him how to read. And again, 
Mom, teach your kids the truth on your lap. And that will do it. Now, when I was doing this, I sent the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the roughs, my drafts, uh, my roughs to uh, my graphics lady, and she sent them back to me in pen and ink. And I said, what is simpler than a coloring book? So this is that book, uncolored, all right? Uh, it is the same book. <clears throat> I have had, um, I, here's what a lot of people do. They buy them both, and then the kid looks at this one and colors this one to match, learns how to color. And I saw it. I, I saw this pastor. He bought both of them for his grandson. Uh, and after church, uh, his grandson is laying on his, his grandfather's living room floor. He's got that one open. He's got this one open to the co- corresponding pictures and color them just like he saw it in there. And that's how he got all the people the right shade of green. Glad he wasn't my grandson, I'm telling you. And uh, just for information, <clears throat> James White has this one. So how do you know? I sent it to him. I care about him. I sent it to him with the crayons. Uh, and I told him, I said, James, I said, I wanted to give you something that was on your level. Uh, and, uh, and I told him to read it, and I said, now remember, James, the two most important things. Stay within the lines. Don't eat the crayons. So, um, <clears throat> so those are back there. Uh, and then if you are absolutely the cheapest thing on earth, uh, and we're going to be using uh, one of these. Uh, these are four tracks uh, on the King James. Uh, these two I did not write, but we published. They have some uh, a lot of times people say, do you have anything with just some verses that are changed in modern translations? Yeah, these three, these two and this one. Some years ago in here, uh, I did a, a lesson called More Than Doctrine. Have you ever had anybody say this? Well, I can still find the doctrine in my modern translation. Well, I tell them, that book is not a doctrine textbook. It is where we get our doctrine from, correct? But it's more than that. Did you ever hear anybody say, uh, you say, hey, what are you doing tonight? I think I'll go home and read my college textbook. That is a slow death, isn't it? And so, um, guys, we, this, is, this is a doctrine book, but it is, this is also the power to preach. This is also a history of Israel and of the world, right? Uh, and so this points out some of the problems with modern translations that are not doctrinal, like they can't count, little things like that. In fact, uh, I might have shown you, because I flew in, when I drive in, I have all of my modern translations in a couple of briefcases in the back of my truck. <clears throat> but I flew in, uh, and, and one of the things that I do is I'll have eight guys. I've got eight modern translations. I stand with the King James. I read these verses. Uh, example. Uh, take a look. Take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1. And, and it says this, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. That's what 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1 says. Right? Okay. Does that sound like a controversial verse? <laughs> that, that verse, that verse right now is like the Gaza Strip. It is a war zone. That little verse. 1 Samuel 13, 1, Saul reigned one year, and when he reigned two years over Israel. Okay, let me tell you what modern translations do with that. Uh, today's English version, also known as Good News for Modern Man, takes the whole verse out. There's no verse 1. It was too hot for him to handle. The Living Bible uh, reads like the King James, that Saul had reigned one year, and when he reigned two years over Israel. The Amplified uh, says Saul was 40, in brackets, years old, and he reigned two years over Israel. The New World Translation, Job Witnesses, said Saul was, question mark, years old, and reigned two years over Israel. The New King James says one year and two. Now, listen to these three in a row. The New English Bible says, in that verse, Saul was 50 years old and reigned 22 years over Israel. You say, you think that's wrong? Doesn't matter. Because here's what the New American Standard says. Not 50 and 22, but 40 and 32. And the New International says 30 and 42. <laughs> so you got 50, 40, and 30, 22, 32, and 42. I, I taught that one time, and this woman, she should have baked the cookies. And she came up and she said, I don't understand. They all three add up to 72. I mean, there are just some real tragedies in this world. I bet she had a driver's license, too. Anyway. <laughs> But here's the real kick. If you've got a New English or an American Standard or a New International, 
where it says 50 and uh, New English, 50 and 22. Uh, New American Standard, 40 and 32. New International, 30 and 42. You know what it says in the margin of all three of those? There's no Hebrew for those numbers. There is no Hebrew for 50, 40, or 30. No Hebrew for 22, 32, or 42. You say, where did it come from? I think, I think Brother Eddie said it. I say it all the time. I said, I, I call it that just undigested pepperoni, okay? <laughs> they went to bed eating too much pizza, like he said. And so that shows, um, that shows some of the problems, modern translation. They put problems in where there were no problems. Now, I want you to go to Judges chapter 1, verse 14. We haven't even gotten to the lesson yet, <clears throat> but, um, but this is a killer. And in Judges 1, 14, uh, Caleb had given his daughter uh, and her husband, Othniel, some land. Uh, <coughs> Joe, are you there? Okay, stand up and read Judges 1, 14. And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she lighted from off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? Now, let me give you a heads up. Even some of you, you think that the King James Bible is Old English. The King James Bible is modern English, okay? Uh, and some of the stuff that you say, that's archaic, it is not archaic, it is English. It says she lighted from off her ass. She got down off the jackass. That's what she did. When you, I'm, in, I'm in England, I'm sitting in Heathrow, and you ever hear, say, hear you're in the airport and it says flight 421 has landed? You know they never say that in England? They say flight 421 has alighted. They still say that. Uh, you ride a train, and it says for the pastors, they don't say are going to disembark. They say Past, for the pastors who are alighting. So alighting is not archaic English. It's just, it's modern English. We have an English English Bible. But in that verse, here's what the New English Standard says, the New English Bible says. And as she sat on the ass, she broke wind. <laughs> and Caleb asked her, what did you mean by that? <laughs> Guys, even I knew what she meant by that, all right? Isn't that a gas? And so, um, uh, so and, and here's, now look, are you going to stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ? Are you concerned about some things you're going to answer for? Well, let me just give you just a little bright spot in your future. Aren't you glad you won't have to answer for having done that to the Word of God? By the way, that's not in there once. It's in there twice. Uh, that is a parallel to uh, Joshua chapter 15, verse 17 or 18. It says the same thing twice. But the one we're going to be looking at today <clears throat> is this. this is, uh, I have read the New King James Version four times cover to cover. And here's why I did it. Now, it under, under no circumstances am I under the, uh, uh, the fantasy that it's the Word of God. By the way, these four tracks are a buck. Um, you know, we have kind of a list of verses and you say, check this verse, and it's changed in the New American Standard, and it's changed in the NIV, and it's changed in the Good News for Modern Man, and it's changed in the ESV, and it's, you get to the New King James. And let me tell you what they did when they translated the New King James. They had our list of verses right beside them and did not change them. So you think, I got this list of verses to check, and I'm gonna, you're going to have a problem. So, so to find out what was wrong with the New King James, I had to read it, read it four times, and this uh, is the culmination of the four times uh, that, um, that I read the King, New King James. Just uh, an example here. The word Lord is deleted from the New King James 66 times. There is no Jehovah in a New King James. The blood has been removed 23 times. Uh, there's, the word damnation does not appear. Fornication removed 23 times. Heaven gone 50 times. God 51 times. Repent 44 times. 22 times uh, hell is not mentioned. The word soul is deleted 137 times. The devil drops out 26 times. And the word New Testament that isn't even found in it. But uh, what we're going to do uh, is we are going to look at problems with the New King James the first hour. The reason we're doing this <clears throat> is because, uh, because um, here's what maybe somebody sitting here thinks. You think that the New King James is the King James without the these and thous. And it is simply not, all right? Uh, and, um, and so that's what we're going to look at. Now, let me ask you a question. What is simpler than a single syllable word? <laughs> Nothing. 
How many of you, like me, uh, you started out reading C, Spot, Run? You remember that? What is that? Single syllable words. What did I say to my kids? Go clean your room. All single syllable words. And uh, back on the table, I have a book. Uh, uh, it. Uh, I had this. Uh, I had two thoughts, and, and and to have two in one day was amazing. Uh, my first thought: You've heard this. Uh, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That verse is composed of nothing but single syllable words. For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is lost. Nothing but single syllable words. And my first thought was, okay, how many verses like that are there in the Bible? Uh, that started a, a three-year study, ten times through the Bible, and I isolated 916 verses that are made up, composed of single syllable words. Then my second question or second thought was, okay, now you've all heard this. You have all heard that the King James is hard to read, harder to read than any modern translation, right? And I'm thinking, what's simpler than a single syllable word? So I checked those 916 verses in eight modern translations. And I can't tell you, they're on the back of the cover. It's a great big book. Looks like your, your phone directory. And... Um, uh, it, but it was checked in the uh, English Standard, the Holman Christian Study Bible, um, the New American Standard, NIV, the New King James, Good News for Modern Man, Living Translation. There were about, uh, uh, there were about eight translations. Uh, I checked 916 verses in eight translations, uh, and I compare. Um, if I'm not mistaken, in 916 verses, the New King James may, adds a, adds a multi-syllable word 126 times. I prove statistically that the New King James, which is what I had in my hand there a second ago, that the New King James is 14% more difficult to read than a King James Bible. The New Living Translation, if I'm not mistaken, this is off the top of my head. You can see I don't have much on the top of my head. But um, the New King James, I think it's 486 times, or I mean, the, the New Living Translation, 486 times it makes the verse more difficult to read. It is 53% more difficult. You say, well, we are King James, but I'm going to buy our grandson a new living translation because it's easy to read. It's 53% more difficult than a King James. I always say it this way. King James Bible, that is the C-spot run version. New King James, this is observe the canine, motivate. <laughs> By the way, some years ago, somebody accused the New King James when it came out of having this symbol, and they said it was satanic. Um, and there's a lot of argument. You can decide what you want, but I'll tell you what I have. Uh, I have a picture. It was taken about 15 years ago of a gay pride parade in New York. Now, I, that's what it's called. They're not gay, okay? You ever see two of them in action? Gay will not come to mind, okay? But that's what it's called, and it shows this gay pride parade, and they're carrying banners, and they got that symbol. <laughs> Homosexuals, trying to, press, to promote homosexuality in our country, and that is the symbol that they're carrying. Now, I don't know. You can give me the history on that symbol, you can tell, but I'm going to tell you something, pal. If that's what they're carrying, I certainly don't want it on the front of a Bible. All right? So what we're going to do is basically we're going to go through uh, what I just had in my hand. <clears throat> we're going to go through this, uh, a good bit of the information that is in this King James, uh, New King James uh, tract, to show you uh, that the New King James problems with the New King James Version. Uh, example, and I, I, I can't give you a copy of this, but, it, but it's all in that track. So if you don't even have to take notes if you don't want to. All right. So you got, here's, I'm going to give you the reference, the New King James Word and the King James Word. You say, why are you doing it in that order? Oh, just because I think it's interesting. Uh, example, uh, in Genesis, chapter 18, verse 1, uh, you're, the, the Bible says, well, here's what King James Bible says. The Bible says that, that Abraham dwelt in the plains. Now, can I ask you a question? Does the word plains confuse you? You don't know what the plains are? Um, Upper where Brother Brandon is from, uh, you get up to his place and turn left, and you head out for the plains. Okay. I'm telling you, they call them the Great Plains, Kansas. That stuff is, is flat as this floor. You shoot a gun 
and the bullet won't hit anything. It'll just go out and skid to a stop. There's just nothing out there, all right? right. And uh, so everybody knows what the planes are, but see, that's, a, that's stumped your spiritual growth. That has, uh, that has so hurt you because, you see, the New King James got rid of the word planes and put in terebinth trees, which makes me wonder if they believe in evolution. <laughs> Maybe they thought, <laughs> hey, look, there's Abraham up in limb three. Um, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 35 and verse 4, it says there was an oak, but it wasn't really an oak. <laughs> Are you ready for this? It was a terebinth tree. Now, there's a, there's a gift of interpretation here, and I'll explain it. You'll see it. Uh, it'll come to light. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 11, the Bible says it is dung. Uh, the New King James says it is awful. Now, if you said something, that's dung. If somebody said that was dung, would you understand what they're talking about? If they said it's awful. Personally, I just think this is just awful. But um, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 7. Uh, the Bible talks about the coney. And this is not a, not a hot dog with onions and chili. But um, uh, the, um, the, the uh, New King James calls it a rock hyrax. Now, you know what the coney is. Coney's, uh, we call them a rock chuck. You ever have a, a wood chuck? And so that's the same thing, except it lives amongst rocks instead of, uh, uh, in, instead of uh, uh, below the wood, below the ground. I like this one. Judges chapter 8 and verse 13. The New King James says, The ascent of Harry's. Isn't that enlightening? Because here's what your old, archaic, hard-to-understand King James Bible says. The sun was up. <laughs> Did anybody see the ascent of Harry's today? I told you, I'm not, inter I'm not interested in sunrise. I'm not interested, sir. Oh, okay, I'll try something. I'll try something. I'm trying to sell you the track, Rick. Okay, he says he can't read this, <clears throat> so we'll try, um, watch this, watch this. So in uh, 1 Samuel, that's awful, isn't it? <laughs> that's awful, isn't it? In 1 Samuel, chapter 22, and verse 6, um, the New King James says, Tamarisk tree. King James says, tree. So what a tree. Uh, maybe you know your trees. I know my trees. Tree. Wood, bark, leaves, or needles. Tree. I know what they are. Um, let me ask you a question. How many of you... <coughs> In 1 Samuel chapter, or 2, 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 5. I wonder how many of you know what a cistrum, not a cistern that holds water, but I wonder if you know how, how many of you know what a cistrum is. Because I'll guarantee everybody in this room knows what a cistrum is. You all know. Does anybody know what a cistrum is? Yeah, you do. See, that's the New King James word. Now, let me ask you a question. This, they took a word out and put cistrum into the New King James. And none of you know what it is. How can it be easier to understand? How can it be helping you? What is a cistern? A cistrum? Well, you know it in the King James as a cornet. Now, you know what a cornet is, don't you? Dodge built about 1967. If you got the, the Hemi with the, with the 727 transmission, you had a car. Um, how about uh, First Kings? And uh, chapter 10 and verse 2, the New King James talks about a retinue. Now, for some reason, every time I hear retinue, I, I kind of want to go like this. <laughs> it's just, you know, 
Uh, how are your retinues? But that's not what it means. You know what it means? Train. You ever hear uh, some? Uh, I, uh, what, was, what was her name? Uh, Princess Di. They now call her Princess Died. But um, they said when she got married, the train of her of her wedding gown was thirty five feet long. Thirty five feet. That's that's almost from here to that back wall. All right. So so, but they didn't say the retinue of her wedding gown. They said the train. And if people talk about a retinue, most of you don't know what it's talking about. They say train. You know exactly what it's talking about. So how can anybody say the New King James is easier to understand? Guys, you know what your problem is, really? You know what your problem is? You're Americans. And you always believe the advertising. Learn French while you're asleep. Eat anything you want and lose weight. Right? Don't leave your living room and make $10,000 a week. I, you guys, you know something? I, had, I almost made $10,000 last week. I really did. <laughs> I put Lincoln's head on backwards. Anyway, um... Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 14. The new King James is very, very scared because they heard a night creature. Say, where do they live? Usually under the bed or in the closet of any eight-year-old kid. I say, oh, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to bed. There's a night creature out there. And the King James comes along and says, don't worry. Just a screech owl. So once again, the New King James uh, is simpler. Uh, Daniel, Daniel <clears throat> chapter 6 and verse 2. Does anybody know what a satrap is? Now this has nothing to do with golf. Anybody know what a satrap is? We all know what a satrap is. You really do. It amazing. Now look, look, I want to give you, again, I know I keep saying I give you a thought because you don't think. Uh, what if I told you that um, tomorrow, <coughs> 250 million criminals, tomorrow, 250 million criminals, we're going we're gonna to enter our country. You'd say it can't happen. Okay. Do you know what happened some years ago? Uh, I was in New York in 1982. It was the first state that did this. Here's what happened. Some guy who never broke the law. Didn't get drunk, shoot anybody, do anything wrong, rob a liquor store. You know what he did on a Monday morning? He did what he always did. He walked out of his house. He went to go to work, got in his car, and drove to work. Just like he had Friday, except when he did it on Monday, he was a criminal. You know why? Because over the weekend, they passed a seatbelt law. And Friday, the previous week, he'd always gotten in his car, didn't connect his seatbelt, and, and went to work. When they passed a law that said, you gotta, you got to buckle your seatbelt, didn't that overnight make everybody that, ought to, that didn't put their seatbelt on overnight a criminal? So if they pass a law today that says uh, there's no, no guns to be allowed owned by anybody in this country, doesn't it make every gun owner overnight a criminal? Think about that. 250 criminals overnight. 250 million criminals <clears throat> overnight. And what I'm telling you is that you aren't stupid, but overnight they make you ignorant. You say, how? Because now all of a sudden, you got to know what the ascent of Harry's is. You got to understand what Ophel is. You got to understand, you knew your Bible until they brought one out to make you dumb. What is a satrap? You all know what a satrap is. Princes. That's what your King James Bible says. See, that's, guys, that's why you want a Bible from England. You know, with Satrap Charles. Hosea, uh, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 13, the King James Bible says elms, but it's not, it's terebinths, oh, those, those terebinths are amazing because they show up everywhere, but you have to have the gift of interpretation, here's the gift of interpretation, if it says oak, it's really a terebinth tree, if it's plains, it's terebinth trees, and if it's elms, it's terebinth. Didn't that just clear up your Bible study? And, and this one I love. I really love this. Uh, Brother Mick, come up here if you would, sir. Take my new King James and open it to Titus chapter 1. 
Look at your Bible in Titus chapter 1. And Titus chapter 1, um, Joe, are you there? Okay, stand up and read Titus chapter 1, verse 6. Now, this is talking about the children uh, of an elder or of a pastor. Go ahead. If any be blameless, <coughs> husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. Okay. He said that the children of, a, of an elder should not be guilty or accused of riot and unruly. Is there anybody here that does not know what a riot is? I mean, watch the Occupy Hell movement. Every place they go, it's a riot, correct? Do you know what unruly is? You ever been going through the grocery store and somebody had a child that had no arms? They had tentacles. You can put this kid in a grocery cart and he can get things from both shelves at the same time and scream when mom takes them away. Riot and unruly. Now, watch how the New King James made that easier to understand. Mick. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Dissipation. Thank you, Mick. D not accused of dissipation or insubordination. <laughs> I tell people, I said, I don't know what dissipation is, but every time I hear that term, I want to take Pepto-Bismol. I don't know, you know, oh, I think I have a little dissipation. Insubordination. Apparently, we're not going to spank them anymore. We're going to court-martial them. They, you know, you're going to the brig, boy. Now, here's what I'm showing you guys. No one, no honest person. And I'll tell you what shows up here. When you show this to anybody with a modern translation, <clears throat> you know who shows up? The Democrats. The spirit of the Democrats. Do you ever notice that no matter what anybody does, uh, I just heard this bozo, Democrat, of course. Uh, you know our president has finally realized there's a crisis down south on our border, so he's gone down there to raise, to three fundraisers to, to fix it. Uh, but he's not going to go to the border. He's not going to go where those, those poor Mex those, uh, oh, they're not all Mexican, they're Guatemalans or everything else. Um, he's not going to show up. And so, do you, you understand how blatant that is? You remember how the, the news media absolutely crucified George Bush for not showing up at New Orleans? And so, so here's this guy, and he goes, uh, they said, hey, the president, he's a Democratic spokesman. And they said, well, the president's not going to go see that. And he says, well, you know, when the president goes someplace, it's very disruptive because of all the Secret Service, and they just don't want to cause more disruption. I mean, is this not amazing how a Democrat can spin something? And... And guys, you, you need a Democrat to convince you that the New King James is e easier to read than the King James. Because you can't tell me that anything here is easier than anything there. The King James word in almost every case was a single syllable word or a very uh, easy to understand word. And every time it was altered into, a, into something you didn't know. Oh, I, I flipped these around. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, uh, every time... Uh, the New King James was more difficult to read, correct? More difficult to understand. Uh, again, let me, let me help you with some definitions. People say, um, well, the King James is hard to read, and my modern translation is easier to read. I can prove that's not true. Uh, can we carry this on? Easier to read. Does that not mean this? Easier to understand. Don't we all know about legalese, the party of the first part would like to dress the party of the second part, that furthermore, and from this day forward, they, right? And they go, uh, what does that mean? Uh, this guy wants to talk to you from now on, right? So easier to read should be easier to understand. Now, here's what we're going to, you know what you're going to do right now? You are going to be God for just a moment. You are God, all right? Does God want to speak to us? Does he want to alter our lives? Does he want to get some things out of our lives that don't belong there? Does he want to put some things in our lives that will help us glorify him? Okay, so here you are, you're God, and you're trying to do this with the, just the saved population. And you're, and you're hampered by the difficult to read King James Bible. Then if a, if a modern translation is easier to read, wouldn't it be easier to understand? If it's easier to understand, 
then wouldn't you be able to get more bad things out of people's lives and more good things in them? All right, here's the challenge. Show me the revival from any modern translation. I mean, it should just, it should just happen. Yep. This is like saying, I'm trying to start a revival and your light and match is throwing it into green grass right after it rained. Man, this just isn't working. This King James just won't light. But you shouldn't have much trouble walking over to where it's been dry and throw one match and the whole place goes up. Where, why wouldn't God put his stamp of approval on one, at least one, modern translation? Because they're not easier to read and they're not easier to understand. Now, the second list is similar to this one. Uh, but this is basically <clears throat> nothing but. So these, these are just simple words. But, um, but this one is going to be this one is going to be um, words that are indeed <clears throat> single syllable. Uh, you got the reference. You got the AV. And you got the New King James. All right. In Genesis chapter 9 and verse 9, uh, the King James Bible talks about seed, talking about your posterity, talking about children follow you, seed. We all understand what that means, right? I'm going to bless Abraham and his seed, correct? Uh, single syllable word. What does the New King James uh, replace that with? D. Sen, dense. We just went, <clears throat> we just went from one syllable to three syllables. Argue all day long. That's not simpler, right? Ruth, uh, Ruth, chapter four, verse five. The Bible simply says, raise up, two single syllable words. The New King James says, per, pet, you, eight. You just went from two single syllable words to one four syllable word. If you told somebody raise up, and, and here's what I want you to do, okay? Because, because guys, you know, we are no longer, even us, we are no longer interested in truth. You know what we're interested in? Winning the argument. What are, talk what are talking points? Talking points are, just say this, right? How many times, uh, I'll give you an example. How many times you said, uh, uh, example, what did, uh, uh, what did uh, Obama do when he passed, the, um, when he passed his uh, health care? They used the nuclear option where they had just 51 votes. You know what he said? Well, George Bush did this, but not for national health care. You understand? Uh, they're saying, you know, that uh, Obama has, has signed fewer executive orders than George Bush. But look what they've done. Okay? And so, so here's what happens. They say that the New King James is easier to read or modern, uh, any other modern translation. But guys, there it is for you to see. Don't buy what they're selling you. First uh, Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14, King James Bible says evil. Now you say, that's not single syllable. You know, I looked at a dictionary and they do count sometimes evil as single syllable, but that's okay. We're not going to say it's evil. Let's just do the Hebrew word, democrat. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, here's what the New King James says, distress-ing. So you went from... If you want to call that, uh, if you want to call that two syllables, but again, here's what I want you to do when we're looking at this. Forget about you if you can do that. You're trying to explain these words to a nine-year-old. Imagine, because guys, aren't nine-year-olds less educated? Not, uh, you know, they're. Yeah, you know, I remember when, well, again, when Luke was starting math. I think he was uh, 19. Anyway, um, when Luke was starting math, he's having trouble with two plus two is four. He didn't even know that it was seven. And so, um, 
Uh, and you know what he's thinking? I am never going to get this. Do you remember starting out math going, I will never get this? Here's this little kid. He's this big, and he's, he's trying to get two plus two. Today, he talks algebra equations with his mother. I hate him. Anyway, and so a nine-year-old isn't stupid, but their brain isn't completely developed, correct? And, and they, there are some things they don't understand. So, you know, you're going to do this, and sometimes you'll come to the rescue for these, for these modern translations, but imagine trying to explain these things, the, the change from this to this to a nine-year-old. Because time and again, the nine-year-old is going to say, well, I understand what's over here. I, I really don't understand what's over here. Because it is not easier to read. Uh, here's a simple one. 2 Kings chapter 12 and verse 5. It says, breach. Now, that's amazing because there's one, two, three, four, five, six letters in it. <coughs> <coughs> and it's still one syllable, a breach. Uh, when they attack the wall, they want to put a breach. You know the most amazing thing about men, and I don't want this to be an amazing thing about l women, ladies. I'm sorry. I don't want you in combat. I'm not afraid you're going to outperform me or anything else. There's just something about, you know, watching a woman go into the breach. She doesn't need to be. I'm not excited when I see the woman coming home in her army uniform hugging her kid. She should have been home, all right? But, but here's the amazing thing. Men will always rise to an occasion. Uh, and the British were attacking a, a uh, enemy fort. I'm trying to think if it was, I don't think it was the, the French. But they said, we're going to breach the wall. And the first men through that breach are going to get killed. Do we have volunteers? And they had to turn men back because they had too many volunteers. And they, they charged the breach. They blew a hole in the wall, and the first guys threw the breach. And the whole thing, the idea, was the breach was a diversion. They came through the back way. But there's, men will always arise to that. So you breach the wall, unless you have a, uh, uh, a new King James. And then it's D, lap, a, uh, day, shun. So you went from one word with, uh, with single syllables to one, two, three, four, five syllables, and I'll bet a kid understands what a breach is more than he understands what a dilapidation is. Um, Jeremiah 36 and verse 6. He says, listen to the words of my mouth. What parent hasn't said that to their kid? <laughs> Right? Will you listen? So, what did the New King James say? The New King James said, In struck shuns. Now, you can, you can sell it all day long that the words of my mouth are instructions. But mouth is, is a single syllable word. Instructions is more difficult. Uh, Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. The Bible says that Cornelius was of the Italian band. Just cutting their first CD, by the way. But um, uh, it wasn't the Italian band. It was the reg uh, meant. So you went from, you went from one single syllable word to a, a uh, trisyllable word, more difficult to understand. Uh, here's one. Acts chapter 27 and verse 17. Could I ask you a question? Do you guys, do you guys know what? Let's see. You know what Sirtis sands are? Sirtis sand. You ever like read about Sirtis Sands? You ever walk near Sirtis Sands? I'll bet you everybody here knows what Sirtis Sands are. That's the New King James replacement for quicksand. You all know what quicksands are, right? So imagine your kid has to walk across the, 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 through the woods and you say, stay away from the Sirtis Sands, and he dies in the quicksand. Right? Uh, would you want to see a sign that said, or you said this to your kid, stay away from the quicksand, and he goes past the sign that says, beware of the Sirtis Sands. 
Guys, it is not easier to read. And it is not easier to understand. And then this one that we just looked, and it's the double-barreled one. I love it. That's that Titus, chapter 1 and verse 6, where it says, Riot and unruly, and those are changed to dis a patient and in sub ord in a shun. So you went from riot, again you can call it two letters, you can call it uh, two syllables if you want, but there isn't a nine year old on the planet that doesn't know what a riot is. Ask him, ask your nine year old, if you got a nine year old, say, do you know what dissipation is? I had that once, I had to stay home from school. One, two, three. You went four syllables and a word they don't understand. From unruly, a kid knows what unruly is. And it went from one, two, from two syllables they understood to one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six syllables. Guys, you say, why? Because the New King James is not, by any stretch, easier to understand. It very simply is not. Now, uh, I just want to show you uh, another couple problems with it. I'm going to have to erase some of this. And um, the New King James does a very strange thing. Now, now, uh, have you ever heard this? Uh, somebody says, well, if there's a perfect English Bible, there has to be a perfect French Bible, there has to be a perfect Italian Bible, there has to be a perfect German Bible. Can I give you the answer? Who are you to obligate God to a statement He never made? Who do you think you are that you're going to obligate God to a statement? He never said that. Okay? And, and another one, I get this. Well, the King James Bible doesn't capitalize all the words that refer to God. The King James translators never said they were going to. They never made that claim. The New King James translators said they would. The King James did not. Why would you obligate somebody to a rule that they never made? And I'm going to explain why, uh, uh, why I think maybe that's what happened. But um, this is very strange. This is, uh, I call this the confusing capitalization. in the New King James. And by that I mean that in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 32, whoops, 32, well, see if I can get this right, 32, uh, verses 15, 18, 30, and 31. All right, in Deuteronomy 32, verses 15, 18, 30, and 32, the word rock appears, referring to God. They said they would capitalize words that refer to God, and they did. Um, in 2 Samuel, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, 1 Samuel, chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, a rock like our God. And rock is not capitalized. Now, what comes next is uh, confusing, interesting, and puzzling. Because in 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 2, the word rock appears in reference to God, and it is not capitalized. But if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 47, the word rock appears in reference to God, and it is capitalized. Guys, that's, 40, that's only 45 verses away in the same chapter. In one chapter, they refer to God as a rock twice, and once it's not capitalized, and once it is. You say, that doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Um, this one bothers me big. Because, you know, you can say, well, Gip, I think you're, you're just trying to make it look bad. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am. I'm the King James guy. I'm supposed to do this. I, look, I have, no, I have no shame 
showing the imperfections of an imperfect Bible. Then you're just like the other guys are. No, because they're trying to show you imperfection and the Bible doesn't have one. That's like saying, I say Allah isn't God. And they go, well, God isn't God. Our God, Jehovah isn't God. You say, well, see, it's the same thing. No, 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 because Allah isn't God. But Jehovah is God. Amen. And, and this is the, uh, an amazing thing. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 11, and the Lord is speaking. Uh, and he says, uh, you guys, you know, you, you, uh, you collect gold, you do this. And you say, any way you can profit yourself by me. Remember that, when he said that? So here, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus think he was God? Come on. Yeah, he did. And you guys, you just stopped dead. You're so scared I'm going to trick you. Jesus referred to himself in a New King James in lower case. Meaning he didn't believe he was deity in a New King James. That's a scary verse. Um... 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this is a classic, verse 4. God is referred to a rock, and it is capitalized in the New King James. But this is also very interesting. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. That's the verse where he said, thou, uh, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Now the Roman Catholic Church claims that Peter is the rock, correct? Let me ask you a question. Is Peter the rock? Who is the rock? Okay. Then that rock is referring to deity, correct? Not in the New King James. It is not capitalized, which means in the New King James, they are claiming that Peter is the rock that the church is built on. Now you say, do you think that's what they were thinking? Not at all. No, I don't think that's what they were thinking at all. But let me, would you like an easy job today? Anybody want an easy job? I'm going to tell you, this is the absolute easiest job on the planet. Anybody can do this. Here's what you do. Is that book perfect? Okay, here's what I want you to do. Take a King James Bible, scratch one word out. I don't care what word it is. Any word. And put a different word in. And what did you just do? You made perfect imperfect. Wasn't that easy? So I don't think that, you know, I don't claim that all the translators said, Let's translate a Bible for the devil. Let's destroy the Word of God. I don't think they did that. I, believe, I told you, I believe Art Farstad, who was the, the, the head of the New King James Translation Committee, uh, when I did this uh, debate back in 1995, Art Farstad was one of them, um, in our closing arguments, they got the, 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 this guy, uh, Ankerberg, he, he went here, 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 here. He wanted to end with Dan Wallace. Prior to Dan Wallace was Don Wilkins from the New, New American Standard. Uh, and prior to him was uh, Tom Strauss. Prior to him was Art Farstad. He was the third one back on the right. And when, when they came to Farstad's closing argument, Farstad addressed something that had not been addressed for eight hours, eight different programs. He said he defended the last, uh, last 12 verses of Mark. He, he defended the ending on Mark that is removed from modern translations. We hadn't had a chance to even discuss it. And, and so then it goes to Thomas Strauss. Then it comes over to, to, to Don Wilkins. And he said, well, I had something I wanted to say, but I have to address what he just said. This is the guy on his side. And when this whole thing's over, Art Farstad he is the only guy on that side that, that spoke to any of us. He came over to me, and he was a scholar. He was kind of a uh, softy, meek, you know. Uh, and he walks up, and he shook my hand, and he said, um, I would have liked to help you more, but, um, uh, um, and walked away. Oh, I got the gift of interpretation. Know what he said? I would have liked to help you more, but I work with these guys. This, these are the guys, this is where I get my, my paycheck. I don't believe for a second our Farstad said, let's, let's make the, king, the, the perfect Bible imperfect. But here's the thing, guys. Let me ask you. If you said, I want to sin today, you think the devil wouldn't get you the taxi to go wherever you want to go? And so when these guys sit down to, to do the easiest thing in the world, which is make perfect imperfect, I think the devil is there. And I think they make changes they are not even aware of. Now, about done, we're not, we're not, uh, I'm not going to write these down, but in here, 
Uh, have you ever heard this about the, the New International? Uh, they'll say it is gender inclusive. Okay, I'm going to throw you all out. I want you all to get out of here. Now, have I included you? No, I haven't. I've excluded you. If I told the men to get out of here and keep the women, have I, have I included the men? No, I've excluded them. So I don't call them gender inclusive. I say what it actually is, gender exclusive, because you're excluding gender. And the NIV uh, makes a big deal about being gender in exclusive because they take gender out. The, I told you I read the New King James three, four times. I intended to read it three times. But on my third time, I began to pick something up that I had not noticed the first three times. And I said, I've got to read this whole book one more time to check this out. And I'm here to tell you that the New King James is more gender exclusive than the NIV. You say, I never knew that. Well, here's why. You know who, you know who the NIV or ESV, uh, it's, it's modern uh, replacement, do you know who that's marketed to? Liberals. And liberals just love to be gender inclusive, right? You know what the New King James is marketed to? Conservatives that would never touch an NIV. So if you tell the, 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 the expected buyers, the potential buyers of the New King James that they took gender out, they won't buy it. So they never told you. And what this is, that is a list of 42 times just in 1 Corinthians, not the New Testament, not the Bible. Just in 1 Corinthians, gender has been excluded. Example, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty six. it says wise men. New King James, wise. 2 verse 4, man's wisdom. New King James, human wisdom. Time and again, the, New King, the King James says no man, no man, no man, no man. New King James, no one, no one, no one. Every man, each one. Any man, any one. Man's judgment, human court. And here is the verse where the, the NIV leaves the gender in and the New King James takes it out, making it more gender exclusive. Notice everything they took out was male. Okay? But in, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 36, it talks about a woman passing the flower of her age and the New King James takes the flower of youth. So they actually removed a woman once. Sorry, ladies. But that's it, guys. So, so it is even more gender exclusive than the NIV. Now, I just want to show you one last thing. Um, uh, go to Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. Do you ever get those smug people? You know, those people walk up to you with this please slap me in the mouth look on their face. And they'll go like this. Oh, you, you use the King James? Yeah. Well, well, which King James do you use? The 1611 or, or the 1638 or the 1769? Which King James do you use? You know, that's not a 1611. Yeah. Don't you just want to go... <clears throat> All right. Um... You know, one of the things, guys, one of the most uh, revealing things was, was reading the Geneva Bible. I have, let me tell you what I have. I have a Geneva 1557. That's when just the New Testament came out. Then in 1560, they brought out the Old Testament. And then I have this one that was called the 1599. Um, give you an example. In the 15, we're talking about Luke chapter 15. In the 1557 Geneva, Luke 15 has 32 verses. In the 1560, three years later, it only has 31. And in 1599, it only had 31. They didn't yank a verse. They, they consolidated two. And that's what I did here. Um, I compared the, the uh, 1599, quote unquote, uh, Geneva to the, to the previous Genevas. I, I compared them to the, uh, the Wycliffe. I have a Wycliffe, a Tyndale, Cramner, Great, and then there's 1557, example. In 1 John 4.10, it says, make agreement for our sins in the 1557. In 1560, it says, make reconciliation. 1559, reconciliation. Now, from reconciliation to make agreement for our sins, that's a major change, okay? And what amazed me, what, what 
Uh, you ever hear propitiation? The word propitiation? In, the 15, in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, in the 1557, it says pacification. In the next two Genevas, it says reconciliation. That's a major change. And what amazed me is I read this, and how many times the Geneva changed from, from, from uh, revision to revision, that this one read the same all the way across. That King James didn't change. There are no revisions of this book. There are additions. But here's the amazing thing. Now, does your Bible say in uh, Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 6, does it not say, what are these wounds, what? In thine hands. Is that not a prophetic reference to the, to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Now, some of the stuff I stumbled on, and here's how I stumbled on this. Um, I had, uh, you know, I told you, when I fly, like, uh, like I have here, I can't bring a briefcase full of uh, modern translations. So I got that New King James from Helmut. I don't know what he's reading now. But anyway, um, uh, and so um, I was in Michigan, and I didn't have the New King James that I had, and so I, I borrowed another one. And it read different. The New King James came out in 1982. Thomas Nelson Publishers. This one here, this is a 1982 edition. And if you look at Zechariah chapter 13 and, um, uh, and verse 6, it says, What are these wounds in your hands? Now, Yes, they changed thine to your. But let me ask you, is the prophecy still there? Well, we, we can't deny that, right? So I got a new King James where the prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is still there. But I'm in Michigan, and I look at this, and here's what nobody told you. New King James Version. In 1994, they made a revision. Has anybody heard about the public the, that, that Thomas Nelson told everybody, we've made a revision in 1994 of the New King James? No. And if you look in a 1994 edition, it says, what are these wounds between your arms? And you just lost the prophetic reference to the crucifixion. And you lost it. Look, you could have, if, if we all said, if I said, hey guys, dump your King James and go get a new King James. And I preached out of Zechariah 13, 6. You still have two different versions sitting in here. Isn't that true? And they never told you. I'll tell you something else I have. This is, this was, uh, a guy told me this. I said, get me one. Have you ever heard <clears throat> that your King James Bible, when it came out, had the Apocrypha between the Testaments. Okay. Um, first off, that was a practice. That was a common practice. A lot of English Bibles had the, the Apocrypha between the Testaments because uh, it talked about the Maccabean re re Rebellion. It was, you remember the 400 years of silence? Well, what took place in the Apocrypha, uh, was some of it was historic, uh, and, and it's recorded in the, um, uh, in the Apocrypha. The King James translators gave uh, seven reasons I wrote these down. This is in the answer book. Uh, it's probably in the, or it's in the Understandable History. It's probably in the answer book. Seven reasons why the King James translators did not believe the Apocrypha was Scripture. They're supposed to be Old Testament books. Not one of them was written in Hebrew. Not one of the writers came to be inspired. You remember Isaiah said, Thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah said, Thus saith the Lord. Daniel said, Thus saith the Lord. No writer of the Apocrypha ever said, Thus saith the Lord. Uh, three, never acknowledged by the Jewish church nor sanctioned by the Lord. Four, not allowed among the sacred books during the first four centuries of the Christian church. Five, they contain fabulous statements, uh, statements which contradict uh, canonical scriptures and themselves. Uh, in fact, Antiochus Epiphanes dies three different deaths in as many different places. I don't know if I have the uh, documentation for that. I read the Apocrypha. I found all three places. And those are, um, 
I don't know where I have them. Uh, it teaches anti-biblical doctrines like prayers for the dead and sinless perfection. Uh, seven, uh, it teaches immoral practices like lying, suicide, assassination, and magical incantations. So, so the King James translators, like so many, put it between the Testaments. Part of the reason they did that, you know why? This is, this is a historical fact. A lot of people bought a King James Bible and had it rebound. They had it taken apart, apocrypha pulled out, tossed, and put back together. But, but in the Old Testament, in the Catholic Bible, that, that apocrypha is, is put out throughout the, new, the, the, new, the Old Testament. Now, there is, a, there is a move today to put the apocrypha back in the King James Bible. And that is solely to, to, um, uh, to appease the Roman Catholic Church and bring us together. I am not for that, but let me explain this. At least their argument is, well, it was there and somebody took it out, right? I have. I have this New King James Bible version. Black leather, gilt edge pages, ribbon marker. And if you open it up, it's a, it's a 1994 edition. You can go online, go to Thomas Nelson, if you doubt this. You go between the Testaments, and it has the Apocrypha. How do you justify putting the Apocrypha in a book it never was in? They are now putting the Apocrypha in the New King James Version to bring the, 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 uh, the, the um, I don't want to say Protestants, well, the Protestants and the, and the Baptists and the Catholics all together. So, um, and, and I challenge you, go online, just, just do a search for New King James with Apocrypha and you will find it. Because I, I thought, uh, maybe, you know why? Because the one the guy gave me, of all things, I said, i got to have that. I want to show people. And he gives me this thing, and I thought, well, this will show him. And the title page is torn. And it doesn't say New King, King James here. I read, the, in, I read the, um, the preface, and it nails it down. But I said, well, I'm going to go online. Guys, beware, beware of just taking somebody's word for it. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. I am challenging you. Go do an Internet search. Type in. New King James Version with Apocrypha, and I'll bet you find it. And that is bad news. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll take a break.